Hello and welcome to Wolfman Gaming. This is my Callisto Protocol Maximum Security Walkthrough. And this is Chapter 7, also known as Colony, as you saw by the title card in the middle of the screen. And, <laughs> woe and behold, this video is part 1 out of 1. This chapter is a little bit shorter than the previous ones, so I managed to squeeze all of it into one video so we have a very busy episode ahead of us we are gonna pick up the last weapon schematic for the assault rifle and we are also gonna take on not one but two bosses and on the subject of bosses in the previous episode i started talking about the fact that i have played a lot of metroid dread lately and i think i mentioned <laughs> that i had gotten to the final boss in that game and i'm still stuck on that bastard because that that that's a tough nut to crack <laughs> and i will say i i enjoy a great boss fight some people don't like boss fights or the concept of them i remember i was talking quite a few years ago to a relative of mine on about this subject because he's not he wasn't a fan of boss fights I'm at the colony. Where are you? he thought the very concept was stupid tower. because Get why here. is there this huge souped up super enemy and i was like so you can do cool stuff and show your skill that you have mastered the abilities the game has made you learn because I think, in a lot of ways, a well-designed boss is a skill check. Because the master of a dungeon or something... Like, Zelda games are a perfect example of what I mean. Because in the classic Zelda games, I don't know about Tears of the Kingdom because I haven't played that yet. I still haven't bought the game, even though I have a Nintendo Switch. I mentioned that, that I bought a used one, and I'm playing it so my fingers are almost bleeding, and I love it. Super fun machine. But in classic Zelda games, you go through dungeons, and in every dungeon you get a special thing. Usually it's a weapon or some kind of art item artifact. And a key thing is that you almost always use it at the boss in the dungeon you're in. And that is a great way to make... Usually the dungeon is based around using the item. Whatever the item may be, whether it's the bow or a hookshot or bombs or whatever. And fighting the boss lets you show that you have mastered this item. Which I think is fun, and that is what a good boss fight should be. Or in a game like Dark Souls, for example, or Sekiro, or... Sekiro actually has a super good example. Before you face off against Genichiro, not, at the, first, not the very first time in the tutorial part of the game, but when you face him uh, atop of Ashina Castle, just before that fight, you fight a mini boss called. What the fuck's he called? <laughs> Swordmaster something. Can't really remember. But that fight is extremely parry based because that mini boss has. He draws his sword and does these flurries of swings. And it's all designed about you parrying at the right time or the entire game is about parrying but that fight in particular and that is a very subtle way and i think it's a great way and quite typical of from software to skill check you to make sure if you can beat this sword master what's his face <laughs> then you are at a skill level where you have a fighting chance against Genichiro. 
And that, I think, that is great. That's how a boss fight should work. To make sure that you're ready for the next area. That's why I think two head is a bit of... It's not a super well-designed boss. Even though I think this game is very fun, I... I think I mentioned that, that the first time I played this game, I didn't really enjoy it, actually. <laughs> I can't really remember why, because when I played through it the second time, and also on, on uh, subsequent playthroughs for my recording and uh, such, I've enjoyed this game very much. It's in no ways a flawless game, as the game... Perfectly illustrated right there. I was gonna pick up the credits instead. Jacob grabbed onto the ladder and was like, I'm gonna go downstairs. Uh, yes, but this is in no way a flawless game. Absolutely not. But it's very, I think it's very enjoyable. The two head boss fights though. It could have been. I'm not entirely, I'm not sure how you would make them better because how the dodge system and this game works makes it it would be hard to make a boss more challenging and make it fair because this game is entirely based the combat in this game is based around the dodge mechanic and a dodge mechanic is as you have probably I'm guessing since you have gotten this far Perhaps with a little help from me, hopefully with a little help from me, because that's why I decided to create this walkthrough, and that's what it's for, and that's its purpose, to help people get through the game. But also, hopefully you have mastered the dodging mechanic. And I think I said that, that in the beginning, when I first started playing this game, I was really struggling with the dodging. By the way, in here is this weapon schematic, the assault rifle, and sadly for me, my <laughs> inventory as always is packed, so I think I drop just hand cannon bullets. If you don't want the schematic, feel free to skip it. By the way, when you grab it, there's an enemy behind you. I'm not sure if he stands there already and is triggered by the fact that I picked up the schematic and just didn't see him because I came in at an odd angle. If anyone plays this and uh, finds out, please, for the sake of everyone, write so down in the comments. But where was I? Yes, the dodging mechanic, because at the beginning of this game I was struggling a lot. It felt like the dodging was very arbitrary. Sometimes I would get hit, sometimes I wouldn't. And I was very pissed, to be frank. But then I realized quite... Or a bit into the game, I realized that the dodge mechanic wasn't the problem, it was me. And <laughs> as I said, I think I said so back in episode 2 already, that you have, the game is quite strict, that you have to pull the analog stick quite straight to the side. You can't have too much, too much of an angle, because then one of two things will happen. Either Jacob will block where I think, I think he does take chip, chip damage, was what I was going to say, uh, when you block, or else he's not going to do anything except, like, tank a hit with his face. By the way, this is quite interesting, because I was backing up. I didn't, I didn't want to engage directly with this blind one, because... I knew more enemies would spawn in, and I don't didn't want to risk getting spotted. And you gotta admit, even though these blind ones, as I've said, are quite lenient <laughs> in their spatial awareness, so to speak, but that was pretty clutch. 
<laughs> that was so close, I could almost feel the coral shape, the thing sticking out from his back. And I must say, actually, even though I think the blind ones are quite an underwhelming enemy as when it comes to being threatening. I really like the design of them. It's quite hard to see in-game because you usually just see the back of them as I stab them. But the very first time you're introduced to the blind ones, there is a little cutscene where you see them because Jacob is hanging upside down for reasons that I... Uh, in all honesty, I actually can't remember. <laughs> but one of these stud muffins walks straight past him, and that's how Jacob realizes that they can't see. But either way, now we have the key card because we are gonna take an elevator out of here, and we had to go upstairs to get the key card so we can activate the elevator once again. And make sure you stay crouched throughout this entire area and this guy is not dead so that hit that was on me <laughs> be aware of him make sure go in i went as we have a saying in swedish i went <laughs> plus minus nothing or plus minus zero actually to be completely correct because I took one hit picked up health and we're square and of course when you activate the elevator some more blind ones have to spawn in because nothing can be <laughs> smooth and streamlined so we just dispose of them and I was hoping to rack up credits that is very sad when you're in an area where the enemies are hell bent on dropping ammo and stuff and stuff like that and your inventory is full and there is no store <laughs> close by. Super annoying. Especially since at this point we are getting close to the end of the game. This is second to last level. So, if you're going for... There is there is a trophy called You Need a Gun. Yes, that's the name of it. For upgrading a weapon to its max. I've talked about that in a previous video. That you can upgrade uh, the hand cannon and just reset your save. Because I think, as I said, the hand cannon is not worth upgrading to its max. The only weapon I really think worth investing in is the Grip Glove. Because the Grip Glove is overpowered, which you probably know by now. If you've played around with it, you haven't seen me use it uh, very much throughout this walkthrough. But especially, like in uh, the previous episode, in uh, the first phase of the boss fight, where we fought against uh, the waves of enemies before Two Head. There you can see the absolute beastly power of the grip club. Because I was flinging those fellas left and right straight off the platform and insta-murdering all of them. And with the grip club also, when you have the throwing velocity upgraded to the max. I think I've said this before, but with a lot of enemies, if you throw them like against a wall they will just splatter <laughs> if you ever been out driving and had a bug flow fly into your windshield that's basically what happens <laughs> you completely dismember them and insta murder them which is a great thing and if you have a chance because we will go into our first boss fight in uh, uh, quite a short time. There will be a store before and also some combat. But if you have a chance at that store, I will tell you when we get there. 
if you have a chance to upgrade uh, the throwing velocity of your grip glove, I would recommend you do so. Because that will make that boss fight potentially a little bit easier. Because that is the boss fight that I would say is the hardest one in the game. By the way, when you get up here, we are going to follow that guy, first of all. And you may have seen there was an explosive canister over to the right. Make sure you don't pick that up here at the beginning. That is also a very janky transition and I apologize about that. But that explosive canister that was right there, we are going to use it. I'm going to throw it straight in the face of a biophage and kill two spitters. But not yet. <laughs> So make sure you don't get uh, enthusiastic, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Uh, not the word I was looking for, but uh, yes. What I'm trying to say <laughs> is leave it be for the time being. And feel you can actually let, uh, let these things be there in this chest. You don't have to pick them up because there is a store just after this little area and we will be able to go back here and pick everything up and when you get up here you will trigger some enemies make sure to backtrack because one enemy will come out through that window so we can take his ass out and there is also a crawler no not a crawler uh, that's not the word one of these fellas ones that explode that actually really crawl and if you want to you can pick up enemies and throw them out over the railing that will also instantly kill them and now we're gonna use that explosive canister because when we run up here it's right there by the way so you know which one I mean first I'm gonna check everything here so if there's any good loot but then I'm going to run up here around this corner and a spitter will crawl over. As soon as he crawls over or starts climbing up, run back and pick up this canister. Because there is also a spitter coming in from behind. So we have two of them. We just throw that canister and we insta-murder both of them. And then there's a, even a third guy up there. I think he usually comes down. Because I was surprised to see him. I haven't seen him there before. So if I recall correctly, he should actually come down to ground level. So you can take out three of them. Like three strikes, you fellas are out. But he was generous at least, dropped 80 credits. And that is the thing. You can feel that this game is quite stingy with credits because usually enemies drop in between like 15 and 20. But it all adds up in the end. <laughs> if you collect it all, it will rack up. By the way, here's the store. An important note. I'm gonna run back and pick up stuff. But when you go up that ladder, that is more or less, that's a point of no return and there will be a boss fight quite soon afterwards. So make sure you sell anything and everything you don't need. And I'm going to upgrade the grip velocity to max. And then I'm going to buy a bunch of shotgun shells. Because as I said, we will be fighting another boss now. It's another two head. So make sure you stock up. Stock up. And if you have left anything behind. Back in this little area. Uh, make sure to run back and pick that up. And sell it if you want to sell it. I Yes. I trimmed that out. What I did was run back. Pick everything clean. And uh, went into the store and just sold it I think. And when we get up here, there are no enemies up here, by the way. We're just gonna move 
over a little bit and then we are gonna go into a cutscene where we fall down below into a courtyard and fight two head once again and this two head fight is a little bit different from the first one because enemies will spawn in and that makes this fight I would say actually surprisingly hard I I personally think this is the hardest boss fight in the game, just due to the fact that you're facing off against sometimes two. But first thing, as soon as the fight starts, do a 180 turn and run into this room, pick up the explosive canister and throw it at Ago. That will make phase 1 go a little bit faster. And as soon as he falls to his knees, split them in half. And Put distance in between you and him as he tears himself in half. Because now, I'm not sure if this is time sensitive or if it's because we have gone immediately into phase 2. But you saw right there an enemy spawned in and there you also saw the awesome power of the grip glow. And the problem is now, another enemy will spawn in at some time. And as I've uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, two head will kill you in one hit. And between him and a regular enemy, the regular enemy can hit you so you get staggered and don't manage to dodge two head. That is what will kill you in this fight, and believe me, because it has happened to me. So when the enemy spawns in, like he did there, I shot him immediately straight to the head or actually I think I clocked his shoulder but he is I would say your top priority because two head we know just <laughs> shoot dodge shoot dodge and try to not be like me make sure you hit try to go for his head because I think if this fight takes too long a third enemy will spawn in but eventually he'll go down, thankfully. And of course after the fight is over, make sure to run around because there is quite a lot you can pick up. And that is also a reason why you should try to get rid of everything unnecessary in your inventory going into this fight. Because they know that this can be a shit show. And make sure to heal up if you've taken any damage. I took one hit when the first enemy spawned in. I don't think they will never spawn in two enemies at the same time. Because that would make... That would, I think, turn this fight into an absolute nightmare. And this fight now... Hope, <laughs> it probably seemed very easy. And it is, it is very easy in all actuality. Unless you get unlucky that's the biggest problem if th you get caught in between two head and regular enemy the enemy can as i said hit you so it staggers jacob and then maybe two head swings and if two head swings and you don't dodge you die <laughs> plain and simple uh, but either way yes i was talking on the subject of boss fights I said I've gotten to the final boss of Metroid Dread. Still haven't gotten past him because that boss, unlike Two Head, he is really hard. Because <laughs> he's fast, he has a, quite a few different attacks. And uh, I'm still struggling to learn his pattern. Because all his, all his attacks are very telegraphed. It's quite obvious what he's gonna do, but he's quite quick. So I'm still working on getting up my reflexes. And I must say, with Metroid Dread, some of the bosses in that game actually have killed me a lot more times than any boss in any Dark Souls game ever has. Which is a good thing. There are very few times where I've actually been frustrated. I said in a previous video that uh, that game didn't tell you anything about where you're supposed to go next 
that was simply not true. <laughs> it does tell you, but I was too slow to realize, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> No, it, it took a little while because I am, I would say, I'm a bit damaged from playing too much Dark Souls and uh, Hollow Knight and Bloodborne. I'm so used to not being able to more or less understand the story, so I have a tendency to, when there are story sequences where, or actually they tell you, what you're supposed to do next. I sometimes space out. Which is not a good thing to do. <laughs> because then you miss vital information. But as soon as I realized how that game operates, it became much more enjoyable. And I must say I've had so much fun playing it. And I'm gonna miss the game when it's over. Or actually that depends. <laughs> if the final boss decides to be a dick and I'm stuck on him for days, then maybe I'll just feel that it's good to be over and done with it. That's a bit how I felt with when I was playing Elden Ring. When I finally managed to beat Malenia, the blade of Mikula. I was so I didn't even feel any sense of satisfaction. I was just like, fine, thank you. Can we go on now? Can we continue? <laughs> and I want to do, before we leave this area, we have moved through kind of a shanty town in this level. And I must say, I really like this level design. It reminds me of uh, Blade Runner and uh, Total Recall. And I think it's probably supposed to be a bit of a wink to those classic uh, sci-fi movies. And Blade Runner is by far one of my favorite science fiction movies of all time. It was one of those movies that I saw the first time very late. Because I had tried here in Sweden... They usually show it on TV around new, uh, in between Christmas and New Year's. And uh, I tried watching it because a friend of mine has always talked about how great the movie is. But the problem is that they will usually show it around like 12.30 at night. And it is a very slow movie. Anyone who's seen it knows that it's quite slow paced. But uh, so if you're sitting there tired already and you haven't seen it, you don't know the movie, you don't have a relation to it. It can be quite a tough nut to crack. But eventually I saw it, I think. The first time I watched that movie properly, I had borrowed it from a friend. I was sitting here at home. I remember it was Sunday. My girlfriend wasn't home. I was hungover as hell because me and my friend had been drinking, playing video games the night before. So I had like one of those frozen pizzas that you finish in the oven. <laughs> Uh, a king size hangover and uh, Blade Runner. So I was like, okay, now I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna watch this supposed masterpiece. And as the end credits rolled, I realized, yes, this is an amazing movie. And since then, I've actually bought it twice. I bought it first on DVD and then I found it on Blu ray. And uh, I thought that is must be a movie that's great to watch on Blu-ray because it's a very beautiful it's a beautiful movie I think. But I must say the Blu-ray version was the laziest release I think I've ever come across. 
Except for when I bought the movie Air America on DVD. Because the Blu-ray version of uh, Blade Runner... If I were to do a side-by-side -side comparison to the DVD I had... I wouldn't be able to tell a difference. Because all they had done was take like the DVD version and put it on a Blu-ray disc instead. Which is sad because... It wasn't very expensive when I bought it, but it wasn't free either, <laughs> so that was super annoying. And just to explain what I meant about Air America, Air America is, a, by the way, an old comedy starring Robert Downey Jr. and Mel Gibson, quite fun. And I loved that movie as a kid, and uh, I bought it on DVD a few years ago. I was super pleased when I found it. And realized when I bought it that they had basically taken the VHS version and put it on a DVD. <laughs> because the, the video was grainy, the sound was... The audio wasn't very good and there were no subtitles at all. So me and my girlfriend watched it. And I could follow along because I more or less knew that movie by heart, watching it so much as a kid. My girlfriend struggled to follow the dialogue in the movie because the audio was so muddy. Total ripoff. But it is sad, but that is what happens sometimes when they do those old movies they just do a quick fix and suddenly they have a cash grab more or less but this lab we're running through now am i the only one thinking alien 4 or alien resurrection as it's called but now we're going into another boss fight this is captain ferris and he isn't doing too well <laughs> And this fight, I said about, talking about Sekiro, I said that uh, when fighting the final boss, Ishin the Sword Saint, look at this, look at this like a dance and you are the woman, let him lead. And the same thing applies to Captain Ferris, always let him come to you and start his combo and dodge his combo and only swing when it's completed. Never try to start swinging until just after he has completed a combo. Because he will hit you and he hits like a truck. He cannot insta kill you but he hits really hard and you can take a lot of damage really fast. Sometimes he will grab you and kick you in the chest like so. Don't fret, you will not take any damage from it. So that is just his way of throwing you around like enemies sometimes do. You know, like they grab you and push you in the other direction, just he's a bit more dramatic. But you saw me, he kicked me in the chest twice I think. And my health is still full, I haven't healed up. And also, a uh, thing to know about that fight, it is a timed fight. So actually, if you want to, I don't think you actually have to hit him at all. You can just stand there and dodge his swings, because Danny is desperately trying to open the door. So Jacob is more or less a human shield slash... <laughs> distraction while she I don't know I can't really remember what she does if she tries to like hotwire the door or something and now we're almost at the end and after this all that remains is actually the final level and I hope thus far that you're finding this guide helpful and uh, perhaps even enjoyable <laughs> Because it, I've, I've had a lot of fun going through the game thus far. We still have the final level to get through. So we are not entirely out of the woods. But 
but all that's left to do here in chapter 7 is wait for Danny to manage to unlock the next door. So we might as well take a few seconds to watch this view. I've said it before, it's well worth saying again, this game is absolutely stunning. But when we open that door, we come to the Wolfman Gaming title screen. So I want to thank you very much for watching. And I will see you again in my next video. So until next time, this is the Wolfman, signing off.